This is Twit. It's clear passwords are broken. Everybody has said this. This is one of the big issues with breaches, uh, people remembering passwords, people use the same password over and over again. Is that something consumers should worry about? You know, I, I don't think it should be the consumers that have to worry about it. I don't think it is their fault. Uh, you know, when we first came up with passwords, we thought we would use the, the freely available human memory <laughs> as a cache for this authentication factor. And, it, you know, it was, it was widely available at the time, and it didn't cost anything. So we thought this was a good idea. Turns out, not so much. It's a scarce resource. <laughs> it, it, it is a very scarce resource, and it tends to degrade over time. <laughs> yes. And, uh, you know, at this point, I think we made a very bad mistake as technologists by telling people, never write down your password. Right. You know, if you had written it down and put it in your wallet with your credit cards, it probably would have been just fine. But we scared people so much by saying, never write down your password, and it always has to be different. And I don't know who thought that asking humans to remember several hundred unique, very complicated character strings would ever work. Uh, and yet here we are, yeah. and, and, and that's where we are today. That's a really good, that's a perfect example of how Really, we got bad security advice that was well-intentioned. It was at the time. But it really isn't the right solution because it turned out that the threat was the threat model was different. I guess people assumed, oh, the threat model is somebody's going to get your wallet and see your password, or you'll leave a Post-it note on your computer, somebody's going to see your password. But that's not where this happens. It happens online. It happens at breaches. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. Uh, looking back through the, the history of the computer industry, you know, if you go back to the 1970s and 1980s when we started having passwords, everybody had one. Yeah. Because you had one system that you connected to. Yeah, you logged into and your Lynx browser. That's right. <laughs> you logged into your Lynx browser to get on, uh, you know, the, the corporate mainframe right. to do the types of things you needed to do. As uh, the industry and as technology has changed, evolved, grown, um, and increased over time, now we do have hundreds of yeah. systems that yeah. we log into routinely. And so the advice that we had in the 70s and 80s is now bad advice, right. but we, uh, we're, we're kind of loath to retire it and to move on to something better. We've seen, I mean, Google has FIDO2. We've seen other authentication proposals. Are they gaining any traction? Absolutely. And if you think about password managers, which was, you know, the kind of the first thing we thought of, I know, let's put all these complicated strings in a database and then dole them out as we need them. We're sort of working our way towards building an interface between the user and the systems because we cannot yeah. We, we cannot ask them to keep doing this on their own anymore. It's just not fair. So it's appropriate. I mean, I tell everybody to use a password manager. That's appropriate advice, yeah? yeah. Well, uh, I will say I tell people the same thing, but they're like, what if it gets hacked? Which, That's a good point. in fairness, has happened. So yeah. I, I'm very curious, what in your ideal password scenario, which should encompass today's reality, what should we think about and what should we do? That, that's a good question. I think that users are pushing back, and rightfully so, on, uh, on the things that you know have gotten out of hand. And we are trying to build alternatives to this, uh, you know, especially to the password part. Um, but I think we, we will end up having to go back to talking about what the real threat model is and how probable it is. Because if you're a security professional, you see so many breaches all yes. the time, you think they are happening all the yes. time. Just like you know, a firefighter sees fires all the time and that's all they think about. But for a regular person who is not seeing this you know, cluster of, of problems, they go through most of their lives without having to worry about this. And I think we should be realistic with them about how often it does Couldn't happen. Agree more, yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, so, I used to work in a hospital and one of the big issues that we had is if you put long complicated passwords on things like medical devices, then the physicians can't get into them when they need to save a life, right? So what are we optimizing for? Right. Yeah. In yeah. general, the IT uh, and IT security controls we have optimized for preserving the confidentiality of data. And as we're moving towards connected everything, uh, the, the consequences are going to be different. The assets we're trying to protect are gonna be different. So we have to come up with different, more robust schemes in that environment. In other words, when the impacts of cybersecurity are uh, human life and public safety issues, we have to do something different. And let me give uh, one quick example. Um, if you could have a, a scenario where a physician walks up to uh, an emergency room computer and it automatically knows that they're there and brings them into the uh, last patient view that they had when they were in with the patient, I would say that that is both, it can be both more secure, right. 
more usable and can uh, speed time to, uh, to get objective accomplished. So that would be biometrics, face recognition, it, fingerprint. It could be many things. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I've uh, been talking about for a little while, and nobody's built a billion dollar business off of it, so if you do, Here's your opportunity. Yeah. yeah, hey, we're in Austin, tons of innovation going on. <laughs> uh, but I call it meta multi-factor authentication, which is if I know a ton about you, then I know who you are. And it's authentication, but it's really identity, right? right. Just like if I walk up to um, a security guard at my place of business, they might know me. They know me not just by my face, but also the way I walk, uh, the way I talk to them. The time of day, they see you. Day. Yeah, That's right. Yeah. We as humans do all of those things in processing, can I let this person in the door? Um, yet we are trying to train computers or train humans to act like computers instead of training computers to work with humans, as Wendy was saying earlier. So I think that uh, one of the solutions is not to look at, um, you know, how do we make passwords better? I think we, we pretty much all agree on this panel that uh, that's not the solution. But how do we get past that and make more contextual um, interfaces within the computer systems that we use? You know, the only problem I see with that is what if the doctor goes outside the hospital and gets hit by a bus? And then they carry the doctor back in, and all of a sudden they, they, they lay her down on a gurney right next to one of the, the devices, and suddenly it pops up. You know, it, it doesn't understand the context switch. The doctor's now a patient, and, and the identity I itself is not enough. And, and especially in, in, as doctors tend to work for you know, multiple health care providers, um, you know, understanding that role is also really, really critical. Yeah, it is. I mean, um, look, there's no silver bullet, uh, but I, I think the model of the future needs to be more um, computers that act like humans and interface to uh, our needs in our workflows rather than the other way around. Well, I think you also hit the nail on the head, Bo, when you said multi-factor. So it's not just the face, it's a whole, in fact, Google's doing this. I know, uh, you know, with gate recognition, for instance, your Android phone, there, everybody has a unique gate. We've got super cookies that are able to figure out who you are based on a whole number of factors that are ultimately unique to you. There seems like this is a solvable problem, but it's going to take multi, multi not just face, not just, you know, gate, not just time of day, but a bunch of stuff that will be pretty reliable, pretty robust. Is anybody working on that? Lots of people are. I think so uh, in different ways, yeah. yeah. Um, but because authentication is is a fundamental issue. It's not just logging into a website. It's everything you do, proving you are who you say you are, yeah. in every respect. Well, and it's going to get even more complicated because we're not just people, but starting think about machines like cars, that sort of thing. So if you've got a fleet of trucks platooning off of each other, like self-driving trucks, can another truck? join that platoon are they authenticated to be part of that so i'm just making i'm just throwing more stuff in it's mm. going to be more complicated not just but, people but this is important and this is kind of where we went wrong in the first place and we didn't really blue sky what the scenarios were sufficiently to understand what the issues we were solving in security were so we did the wrong thing we did passwords and we did uh, and and we told people not to write them down and so it's important i think at this point to think ahead what are the scenarios? What are the, can we do that effectively, reliably? Can we really look ahead and say, well, here's what hackers in the in next 20 years are going to be looking for? Well, we're, we're working on that. So one thing, for example, that um, Duo's doing now is authenticating the user and the device that they're using together. So if I stole your password, I would also have to steal your phone That's for the second like factor yeah. and your device that you were using. Right. Because if I stole any, any you know, combination of something else, even if it was approved by your employer, it still wouldn't work for me. So tying those factors more tightly together is something that we're doing today. Yeah, that's why I used Duo with my last pass because it's a second factor that's really reliable to unlock my last pass. But well, it's hard enough to get my mom to use LastPass, let alone a second factor authenticator. Uh, actually, I told my mom who's 85, just write it down. I did actually say, I went to the store. They sell books that say password on the front. Yeah. Yep. Uh -huh. And but you know, unless somebody breaks into her house, that's actually a fairly safe. It is. Yes. It's very fair. And you know, I, I'm really tired of security professionals who go, "Oh my God, that's so horrible." No, you're not doing the threat modeling properly, right. and actually, you are defending very well against that hacker from Romania or whatever by just keeping it physically right. in your house. Right. And it's she doesn't have to learn how to use LastPass. She doesn't have to. 
but you know, get a second factor authenticator. I mean, it, it seems like a good solution for some people, not for not for everybody. It's not for people who put it on their laptop and then they take pictures of their desk. Those people, <laughs> they should think about that. So that and voice is another thing. In fact, that's one thing. I, I don't think Amazon's doing it yet, but Google does that right now. Where you, when and this worries me a little bit that it will recognize my wife's voice when it, she asks for the calendar versus when I ask for it. But I don't know how reliable or. Google, neither Google nor Amazon can recognize my voice. I'm at all? constantly like, who am I? And they're like, I don't know, but you're on Stacy's account. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Congratulations, they say. You got in. Yeah. yeah. Cool. I think that's one of the next uh, kind of frontiers we have to first recognize and then tackle, which is that some of these things we treat as authentication issues are actually identity issues. Yeah. Okay, just what's the difference? So identity is who are you? Authentication is a challenge to verify that you... Um, have access to this account right. or have access to the account, yeah. right? You yeah. know the things about the account to give you permission. But if that's we, a big difference, it is a big difference. If we separate those two ideas, if we look at identity, then uh, we can say, okay, you are Stacy, and I know that you are Stacy, therefore, you have access to Stacy's things. I could also then say, you know, you're Bo, and you don't have access, or Stacy can say, I want to give Bo access to get into my house because he's staying with me as a house guest this week. Um, so we can do those types of things, but if you have identity linked rather than authentication, then it becomes revocable, it becomes auditable, it gives us these techniques and these capabilities that we really need or want or will need in the future if we don't need them now, uh, to be able to have a greater amount of trust in the technology that we're using. I think we should just, you know, resurrect Babylon 5 and use the questions that they asked on the show, which is, who are you? Why are you here? You know, are you a doctor or are you a patient? Who do you serve and who do you trust? Because a lot of this is also about trust. We, we trust, after authenticating, we trust, you know, you to do a particular thing for the purpose of this device that you are using right now for this application, but not for a different one. And so all of those have to come in together.